Thank you, everyone, for your patience. <clears throat> so we know everyone already. Surveys would be nice. OK. So this is what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to introduce generative AI uh, in more detail than you probably realize from casual exposure just using chat GPT, which I assume uh, you're one of the 100 million people who have signed up to use it. Uh, actually, that's a good question. Who has used chat GPT? Who hasn't? That's what I should have asked. Why? <laughs> OK. Uh, then um, we'll start doing, uh, as Adib said, uh, hands-on development. There's several um, uh, exercises. You really actually don't have to code. You're kind of all set up, ready to go. Uh, so you can explore and you can modify it and interact with it. So hopefully it'll be pretty efficient. And then after that, uh, we'll see a uh, little more details around the Acme Fitness Store. That was what was shown in the uh, keynote, Spring One keynote presentation uh, with the bicycle shopping. And one of the exercises even before that has a uh, uh, code relating to that. So you'll get a, a sense of what's going on there. So yeah, this is the basic assumptions. You know, assume you're a Spring developer, but even if you're not, this should help you get started. Um, yeah, everyone wants to add some AI capabilities, and uh, it's not just uh, for Python developers, right? Java developers, every language is gonna want to have AI capabilities added into their application. So why are we here? I think in part is the uh, spectacular explosion of the release of ChatGPT. Lots of people signed up for it, uh, myself included. I actually uh, first started using it when I had COVID. So I really got intimate with it, right? You, know, you can really chat a long time if you're locked up uh, with COVID. And my uh, takeaway was like, wow, this thing actually kind of works. You know, it's got like rough edges, not perfect, but you can see it's got kind of a pulse. Um, and the opportunities are sort of, yeah, endless. This is, uh, only came out last December, which is not even a year. Yet everyone's imagination is completely uh, running wild. Um, some of them, yeah, we'll get to some of those uh, use cases. Uh, and I think one thing that's important and probably reinforced multiple times is that uh, normally when I thought of machine learning, it was like, well, that's you know, the Python crowd. Uh, they have their models and all these things. Uh, but really now, uh, with this sort of hosted pre-trained models, it's really like a REST API. It's very accessible uh, for any environment to make these uh, API calls. And so in turn, that means it's accessible to Java developers. So these are some of the, the use cases. Uh, the GPT, chat GPT part uh, is you know, around content generation, is chatting with you, is making content. Code generation is another common use case. Uh, I've played around with that as well. It can do some pretty effective things. Uh, semantic search, what this means is, in my mind, bringing your own information that the AI model doesn't know about and asking it to search over it and give meaning, semantic meaning, to that search. And summarization, it's very popular. There's an AI um, podcast I listen to, and because these uh, people are clearly in the field of AI, they uh, now release an AI-generated summary of the transcript of their uh, podcast. So it's kind of weird. You don't even have to listen to the podcast anymore. You can just scroll through the notes and get the effective gist of what they said you know, in a one-hour podcast. It's pretty impressive. And I've listened to the whole podcast and then gone back to look at the summarization, and it, it is works. Uh, so how did we get here? Uh, as I was alluding to, right, there's you know, this general field of artificial intelligence goes way, way back you know, to the 60s, I'm sure. Uh, but then, you know, there were refinements, machine learning, um, where you take data, you train it, you have some kind of uh, model, you, you set weights, you give it input, the output comes out, you give it a score, and then you, you uh, iterate. And then, uh, you know, deep learning, which actually I don't really know the whole details of that. I guess it's just one more level of sophistication. Uh, and then generative AI, where we are now, and the whole thing that captures everyone's imagination. So this is another thing, if I didn't make the point clear enough, this is from one of those podcasts. He's a, a speaker, Daniel Whitnack. Uh, it's an interesting talk on the history. And 
it shows you how even for people who are traditionally in this field, who have been around you know, for a long time, uh, his job right, was to make models basically, right, or to implement solutions for the use cases we were talking about. And what he said was that you know, he has to change how he does his development. He used to say, in order to meet the demands of the use case, I'm going to go uh, gather some data and train a model. He goes, now I don't need to train any model. Right? I just have to write software. And so that's where the P in G GPT comes from. It's pre-trained. So you skip that whole step. Uh, and this is really, really important. And so this kind of transforms uh, AI into being more of a general developer tool than sort of a very specialized area. So consequences, um, it's going to be ubiquitous. Uh, software background, I say, is even more essential. You know, as I've recently traversed the landscape, uh, you know, uh, I can see that you know people who are doing uh, ML development don't have the same sense of like uh, object-oriented design, right? That we do in this room. Uh, so I think it's uh, very important. And it's not just about the model; it's about sort of the software ecosystem around what you're doing, right? How do you get data in and out? How do you make this accessible over the web? And uh, enterprise integration pattern is this old standard of you know, integrating different components and data. These are all super relevant to creating an effective solution. And of course, you know, the large ecosystem that Spring has in projects uh, mean that we can quickly pull together very compelling uh, solutions in the AI space by bringing uh, these components together. Should have put batch up there as well. So we'll get started into it. Uh, I'll give a primer, basically, you know, how I think this material could be understood to Java developers and non-people you know, without PhDs in, in uh, AI. And then we'll start making uh, uh, some code and, and running some code. So I think these are the essential um, key terms, right? Models is probably the easiest to understand. It's the thing behind the API, right? It's the AI model, whatever that is, right? Uh, but there are choices here, and we'll go over some of them. You know, which model to use? How much do they cost? Uh, what's the latency involved? You know, is it on-prem? Is it off-prem? The second most important thing is around prompts. Prompts is sort of the formal term for the input to the model. And this is so critical has given rise to this term called prompt engineering. So you have to get very good at this, and there's lots of help, but you could probably spend a day iterating over this prompt that's most appropriate for your use case. And what's interesting is that uh, what comes back from the model is a string, like literally a Java util string. If you're lucky enough to have JSON in it, you still have to convert that string to a data structure so that you can do something effectively with it in your program. So output parsing uh, is a way to convert that string to some data structure that's useful. Uh, normally, in a sophisticated use case, you can't just present your need to the AI model and expect it to solve it in one go. You have to kind of break down the problem much like a human would and say, well, first we're going to do this part, and when you give me the answer to that part, we're going to do the second part, and the third part, and the fourth part, and so on. And you might make uh, different decisions in this sequence of calls. Uh, so that's uh, more sophisticated, clearly. But you'll quickly find yourself you know, saying, oh, now I need to make a decision. Should I go left? Should I go right? Based on the previous response to the uh, AI model. And customizing, this is maybe not the best word. But it's essentially, how do you bring your data to the model? And we'll get into that. And the last key part is evaluating, uh, namely tests. H how do you know that you're getting effective responses from the AI model? It's like most people, including myself, uh, in the beginning, just kind of eyeball the response and go, hmm, that looks pretty good. You know, it's just human judgment, right? Uh, but that's not really effective if you're going to deliver a solution to you know, thousands of people. You have to make sure it's really rock solid, and you have to get a handle on what it's returning, right? Uh, and make sure that it's okay, or at least keep tabs on how much it might be you know, 
starting to not make sense, right? I'm sure we've all heard of uh, the idea of uh, hallucinations in the AI model, uh, where it just makes stuff up. So oftentimes in the prompt, you have to say things like, if you don't know, just say so, don't make anything up. It's uh, really what you have to do, strange but true. So go into models. So we'll start at the top, I guess. Um, well, maybe we'll start at the bottom. It's a little more historical. The text to numbers part is really like internal. Uh, it's kind of the way that uh, uh, the models work is they convert text into numbers, commonly known as embeddings. Uh, and this is really like the data structure that the AI model works on. And when it comes back out, it converts these embeddings back into text. Uh, before um, ChatGPT hit the you know, scene last December, uh, one year ago this time, last summer, let's say, I forget, maybe June, maybe earlier, um, there was mid-journey and stable diffusion. How many people have heard of those? A few. Uh, this is where you could say, I'd like an image of a fluffy bunny, you know, but I want it to have punked out hair, right? And it would generate this image. And everyone was on their phones showing me, you know, and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, right? Uh, so that's an example of a model. Uh, language in, or maybe an image in, and an image out. You can't do chat stuff with it. Model's not for that. But if you want to generate images, that's the model you'll go for. So this is sort of the map of you know, what you need to pick based on the use case. Uh, so that's language to image. Uh, then you have language code to language code. This is the one we're most familiar with, is what's behind chat GPT. There are others, of course, uh, Google Bard and Meta Llama. These are other players in the space. Um, there's also um, Anthropic Claude, should have on this uh, uh, slide. And now what's happening is a uh, convergence, right? It's happening, uh, I guess, fairly quickly, given how fast the space progresses, where you'll be able to input basically everything and get back everything. So I bet in a year's time, uh, when we're at another conference, uh, multimodal will be leading the way, and you might not actually have to pick your models, but now you do. So these models, uh, they're called foundational models because they're pre-trained. Uh, and again, this is just showing the input on one side uh, and then the type of use cases uh, that you can do on the right side. I've covered some of those already. Um, sentiment analysis is pretty good. This is a positive tweet. Is it not a positive tweet? Things like that. So again, uh, here's uh, maybe some more details. Uh, DALI is the uh, model for creating uh, cats, <laughs> creating images, in this case a cat. Uh, ChatGPT is the one for the interactive. And, uh, so these, these are the ones that you can, uh, models that you have access to on Azure. Uh, so these, these four, right? Oh, sorry, these three. And uh, when you uh, go to the portal on Azure, you have drop-down boxes you know, for what uh, models you'd like. And all this has been uh, done by our, our great team already for you. But really, it's not that complicated when you, you know, read the instructions how to do it yourself. It's very simple. Uh, so the benefits of ChatGPT, uh, it understands conversation. And we'll see how that becomes important. And it understands what you've said previously up to a certain point. And it's very good at being creative. And in fact, there's a, a little dial they call temperature, which is like, how creative do you want it to be? If you turn this dial to zero, it's plain, right? It just kind of speaks very factual. And if you turn it all the way up to one, it's between zero and one, this is when it really starts to make stuff up. So I've asked it questions like, in the Spring Portfolio Projects, is there something that does X, right? And It'll reply, sure, there's a project called Spring X. It doesn't exist. You know? So you, you really have to uh, figure out some knobs. And that's part of uh, the task as being a developer in this space, is to learn these knobs and, and figure out the right way to use it. As I was uh, indicating before, uh, hallucinations, that's uh, when it just starts making stuff up. And uh, this custom tuning part, uh, we'll get to this later, but this is really about how can you bring your data to the model. One way was this custom tuning. 
uh, and some people did it, but these models have you know, billions and billions of parameters. Uh, it's not easy to change the weights of billions of parameters. It's like a giant science experiment making uh, these uh, weights. They literally use the data center for weeks and weeks and weeks full time to, to determine these weights. So a casual person can't just walk up and, and change them. Uh, but models that used to pre-exist before ChatGPT, it was quite common to be able to change the weights. All right, so let's get into uh, some very basic hello world stuff, and then we'll uh, figure out the whole API key situation and uh, get to uh, actually interact with it inside of a Spring application. So as I was uh, kind of alluding to, prompts are really important. You know, what you put in, it's kind of like garbage in, garbage out. But like, how do you construct the text? There's no manual that says, here's the SQL, right? This is a structured language of how you query the database. They're kind of tips and tricks. It understands like placeholders. It understands like, you know, sections, like this sec section uh, describes my problem. This next section describes three possible solutions I'm thinking about. Analyze these three solutions. So it understands like kind of course structure, almost like in a markdown kind of style. Um, and yeah, I can't overemphasize how important this is. And what happens is these prompts become pretty big. You end up like describing as if you would describe to a person what you'd like to get done. And then the one thing you want to change in there is maybe like the topic, right? Like, uh, give me a list of famous blank, right? This is a super small example, right? But what's blank? It could be you know, actors, it could be you know, scientists. So you kind of have this whole body of text and then you have to replace one word. And this is very analogous to uh, the view in Spring MVC, going way back, right? You have all this HTML, and then you have your model, and you just got to stick the model in a few places inside your, uh, you know, your markup to generate HTML. Uh, so you should think of it that way. You're going to literally be looking at curly braces and prompts, uh, and you know, having those uh, templates uh, you know, be a spring resource, you know, file that you can load. And what's happened as well is that prompts used to be, you know, a Java string, that's it, right? Uh, makes sense, most simple thing that could possibly work. But over time, uh, the field has evolved, and now what you send to the model is more structured. So you now start sending, and we'll see examples later, uh, you start sending strings that are assigned a role. So an example is the system role. The system role is something like, you're going to be a helpful assistant around picking bicycles. And then the user role is basically kind of your question or your message that you'd like to send. So the fact that you have these delineations of roles is uh, very, very important. It is just better instructing the model how to respond. Uh, we'll do, I think, two more slides and then we get on to it. So uh, tokens, tokens are important for a couple of reasons. But first, what are they? It's the mapping between words and the internal model. And so words go into tokens on input and they uh, come out uh, tokens back to text. So there are several visualizers on the internet. This is one. And you can kind of see the highlighting indicates uh, what's considered a token. Most often it's a word. But many times, like if it's an abbreviation, you see chat GPT there uh, is four, three tokens, right? The chat is one, the G is another, and the P and the T is a third. Uh, so you don't have to understand it too much about how it does this. Um, and the tokens end up looking like this, right? Kind of an array of data. And if you want to get deeper into it, we can, we can explain that. But what's, uh, so a token is basically 0.75 of a word, so if you took all the works of Shakespeare, 900,000 words, it'd be 1.2 million tokens. The reason this is important is this is how you're billed. So tokens equal money. If you can get your job done with fewer tokens, less money. We all want to spend less money. Um, and what you send to the model counts as a token in addition to what you get back. So if you ask it to write you an, uh, a book, you know, it's not just the input, it's all the tokens that were returned and converted into words uh, on the output. And one part of the space that's very important here is tokens are, uh, 
limited, essentially. So 4K, uh, GPT-3 had 4K tokens, which means that if you asked it something larger than that, the rest of the data would just be dropped on the floor. So of course, people want more space for tokens, right? That's kind of one obvious way uh, to scale, although not the only way. Uh, but you can see a lot of people are taking this and you know, just turning it to 11. So now you have uh, three different offerings uh, in chat GPT or GPT-4, 8K, 16K, 32K. Claude, which is the model from Anthropic, has 100K. And yeah, just to be crazy, I guess the research people at uh, Meta you know, had a million tokens. So if we go back to this example of uh, Shakespeare, if you were asking about Hamlet, you can say, sure, if a million tokens, I can shove everything into the prompt. But if you're only asking about Hamlet, you've just wasted all those other tokens because it's not even going to be remotely matching to your interest. So part of the uh, techniques is to figure out what to put in this, uh, uh, what to send so you don't exceed this limit but still get effective results. And so this is kind of known, I think, colloquially, I don't know exactly, as the uh, context window. So anything larger than that, it just doesn't understand. I mean, it just ignores it, basically. So when you're having the chat in ChatGPT, the reason there's context is because it's also feeding back into uh, the input your previous chat history, even though you don't realize it. And so eventually, if you have a chat that's long enough, the oldest history, or depending on how cleverly you structure it, you know, something starts to roll off, right? And, and you start losing some context. So there are several Java APIs. And uh, as you'd expect in the API space of vendors, uh, no two are the same, right? So this is the first opportunity where Spring can help is providing a portable uh, client so that you can talk to all of these models, but you don't have to change your code, right? You can swap out the implementation. Uh, uh, without uh, affecting uh, the behavior. And so that's where we come to. You know, that's part of the motivation around uh, the Spring AI project. Uh, it's inspired by projects in the Python ecosystem that clearly have been leading the way for some time and are still in many ways quite far ahead. Uh, so this is sort of the first step on that path. Uh, you can take a look at you know, their documentation and the terms uh, that I'm using here are very similar you know, to the terms that you'll find in their documentation. Uh, there's documentation as well for Spring AI, but you should look around and, and look at the ecosystem. So just before you know, we're saying you know, there's an AI uh, client abstraction that talks to all the different uh, implementations, there are other abstractions that can be swapped out. And you know, this is what basically the day is, is going over all these abstractions and examples uh, to build you know, applications. So the model and how you get input and output, we've spoken about prompts, we've spoken about you know, the AI client abstractions, we've spoken a little bit about the difficulty in getting information out of the model into structured data. That's all kind of like the foundational layer. And then it gets more and more sophisticated down the list. You know, if you want to bring your own data so you can ask questions over your own data, that's where data loaders, uh, text splitters come into play, and a technology called vector databases or vector stores, which is a way to manage uh, relevant context to send to it. So I'll only highlight maybe the last one here. Uh, the evaluation part uh, is important to determine if you're getting uh, effective answers. So th this project is you know, not even released yet. It's a, a snapshot. And you know, once we have probably a first you know, implementation of each of these five things, uh, along with you know, two implementations of each concept, that's when we will make a first release. So here's uh, the world's simplest program uh, to say hello world. Um, actually, there's a, a, a Spring Boot starter, so you don't even have to do new <laughs> OpenAI client. Really, all you have to do is write one line, and that's what you'll see in the controller. AI client, generate, give it text, and get back text. Uh, this is like, yeah, the hello world, but Later, you'll see there are more structured ways to send input and get structured output. So all you really need to do, you'll see in the first part, is once you have your keys, it's going to be a one-line controller method. 
and you're gonna you know, curl it with whatever you wanna ask and you're gonna get the response. So I think with that, I'll leave it to uh, Adib and company to uh, figure out how we give everyone the keys and uh, get going. Uh, I don't know how you want to do it. Oh, okay. If you made an org or what you... Okay. What we're going to do is, can you go to your GitHub and show them what... That means they have to install Spring CLI as well. Well, they can just do it from code space from... They can do the code space from... In your own. Okay. Uh, sure. Can you do the demo exercise one? All right. Okay. So wait. So first, uh, let me tell them where the repo is. Okay. Yep. All right. So first, we're going to clone a repo. Let me find out where. It, oh man. No, uh, well, no, let's do the workshop first because um, that'll set the context. But yeah, you're on your way. Good Googling. So to give you a sense of what's coming with this, so there are two different Git repositories. There's one Git repository that has the Acme Fitness application that you saw the demo of on the keynote yesterday. <coughs> And there's another repository which has kind of easy to get going with examples using Spring AI. Does that make sense for both? So, for example, the code to run the Hello World, uh, tell me a joke, that's only going to take, that's going to be like maybe 10 lines of code. And then you're going to start with a series of examples in Mark's repo. You're going to have uh, the ability to quickly learn the Spring AI project or something. Okay? That teaches you how to interact with the large language. Uh, in order for those samples to run, you're going to need Java 17, you're going to need the Spring CLI, and you're going to need uh, an API key <laughs> to Azure Open AI. Um, and so what we've done as part of the preparation for this workshop is we've created a GitHub code space dev container that's in that people. Raise your hand if you've used GitHub code spaces. Okay. Raise your hand if you have a GitHub account. Good. So if you have a GitHub account, right within the code space itself, right within the GitHub, you're going to be able to click and launch a code space. When you launch a code space, what happens is that a virtual machine on Azure gets spun up for you, and you're going to see VS Code directly in your web browser. You can go ahead and start editing and running programs and all of that. That container image, uh, the, the code space that we've created already has Java in it, and you can run the samples there. Does that make sense to folks? Now, if you have your laptop, you have your favorite IDE, you have Java 17, you have the Spring CLI, you can also do that. But that might require a little bit more effort uh, on your part, so feel free to use the code space. Everyone with a GitHub account gets 53 hours code spaces per month. So if you didn't raise your hand to I've never used code spaces before, you have those 53 hours, well, you'll be able to get through the workshop, no problem. Okay. Um, otherwise, we'll try and figure out how to help you and get going with it. Yeah. yeah, I'd encourage the workspace so we don't waste time with the Spring CLI. Yeah, so yeah, we'll use the workspace. Okay. And then when it comes to the actual API key, we're gonna we're gonna put something here on the screen. We'll put it in the chat on the Zoom, so you can actually just run the sample quickly. Right, this is our first time doing this workshop, and the logistics of getting access to ChatGPT with 16K token and all that uh, is is not easy. So um, yeah, so you'll you'll give a, a demo. Yeah, I'll show you how it should work, and then yeah. we'll figure out uh, everyone's individual situation. I'd encourage you to try to clone this repo, right? Uh, that's the first step, sorry. And then use the code spaces, because we've installed a few utilities there that are relied upon uh, in the exercises. So. 
Which chat? The Zoom chat. Oh, the Zoom chat. Uh, yeah, I forgot. Oh, really? How? Okay, let's fix that. That's so weird. Yeah, that is private. Okay. Why is it private? How do I change that? Uh, go to down to the danger zone. More, more, more. Down, down, down. Uh, change visibility. Oh, oh, how weird. There we go. Uh, yes. Already one person's watching. That's fast. That's me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I understand these effects. Make it public. Wow, that's really. Oh, man. Do you want me to? I appreciate everybody's patience. Good time to the work. Yes. All right, I got to unplug this because I'm not sharing my GitHub uh, password with the world. All right, the other effect that you're going to see in the Azure chat, there's a link to aka.msaz.cut. Okay? You want to click on this link, it's going to take you to uh, Google Sheet. And it's going to have a bunch of different rows for different environments. The reason why is that um, in order for you to access Azure Open AI, you need a, an Azure subscription which has been uh, listed, which has been like granted access to ChatGPT library uh, and services. So we have this channeling of normally the way you get access to that is you fill out a form and you wait like a couple of days and Microsoft approves it for your for your subscription. So we obviously couldn't do that in three hours. So what we did is we created a bunch of Azure subscriptions and we filled in all the work uh, last week so they would get uh, allowed to access these services. So what you need to do there is you need to put in the information in each row so that you will then be invited into that subscription. Okay? And that subscription has kind of dollars on it. So once it runs out, it runs out. Um, so, does that make sense for folks so far? Okay, that subscription is relevant for the later on part of the workshop, which given the difficulties we've had with TV, I think we might just have to settle for showing you a demo, and then you can take the subscription invitation and try it out at home afterwards, with the instructions that are there. Um, we don't have enough subscriptions for everyone. The reason why is originally we were told this room would hold 25 people, then we discovered on Sunday that it holds more. We went to the organizers and said, hey, can you just uh, you know, increase the number? And they're like, no, it's impossible. They might reconfigure the room. So we showed up this morning, and it was bigger. We just let people in. So, <laughs> so for the hands-on that's going to be this part, everyone should be able to get to it. For the hands-on with deploying the Acme Fitness and the bike store, uh, watch the demo, and then you can follow along. We'll hang out and see if we can make it. Okay. And it's public, you can drive it on the site. That you have the deputy hanging out with, uh, with, with the code space. Can you send the remote to the router and small? Yeah, I also have to go back to it. I'll tell you what it is. It's aka.ms forward slash zoom dash AI. Yeah, I also have to reopen that to share again. Yes, I'll br put it on the screen. Uh, Am I joined now? I said join. Sorry? Yeah, you can absolutely fork the refund on this. If you haven't seen code spaces before, we'll just sort of give you a quick demo if you have to. Yeah. Oh, if you're, if you're detecting that the spreadsheet is new only, please reload it. What I've noticed is that the internet here is so slow that it's taking Google Sheets like few minutes to recognize that it's editable. So give it a few minutes and then you'll be able to go in and type something. 
right? Yeah, it's, I can't even, uh, yeah, this is the repo. Right. It's on the screen. Does everyone have this? Uh, do I need to keep it up longer? Yes, let me put this in the chat. Oops. I swear, using uh, these uh, online uh, presentations. Would... Okay. So you want me to go where? where I'm... Here? Okay, so this is how, so after you've cloned uh, this, this repo, uh, I only did this like yesterday, so if I could do it, you could do it. So, uh, oh, I have to destroy it. No, 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 you don't. Uh, so I'll all right, you, you talk about this. I'll, I'll explain this one. Okay, so you, everybody here has cloned something, you know, you click on code, and, and what you typically see is you see the URL to clone the code from, right? There's another tab called Code Spaces. If you've never seen that before, you can click on the plus sign, and what that's going to do is it's going to launch a virtual machine on Azure with all of the correct prerequisites already installed in it. Now, this machine is not gonna have a lot of CPU. It's gonna have one core, essentially, two vCPUs. But once you have it, uh, you have all the prerequisites for it. So my recommendation to you is you can fork the repo and then launch it in your account, or you can just launch it from here. Okay? Oh, they're going to run out of money. Sure. No, they won't. On mine? No, it, no. If they launch it from yours, it doesn't hit you. It's oh, them. oh, oh, oh! Interesting. It's, yeah, it's 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 them. It's it's like a fifty okay. free hours. Yeah. My fifty free hours are no, all locked up. No, theirs. Oh, because okay. they're logged in, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So fork the repo. But either way, fork the repo so you have it. Uh, you know. And, and then go from there, okay? So that, once, the, it'll take it a few, uh, it might take it a few minutes to launch that, right? So I'll now show them the. Yeah, don't you want to explain the uh, VS Code part or no? Or are they going to do it in the browser? Is everyone, who has, does not have VS Code installed? All right, that, so I'll show that with VS Code. We could work together to install VS Code on your machine. Yeah, so I'll walk through. Uh, so one thing that's interesting is, uh, is you can, um, connect to your VS Code instance. So I have a bunch of them. Or oh, this is the one that's forming, I guess. So this is the uh, one that uh, I made before. Actually, maybe I'll just wait to get a fresh copy. Because so I think I've already mucked around in that container. It has a whole bunch of state, because I was uh, practicing to make sure it worked. I suppose everyone has to wait a little bit to.
And then there's ways to help them. Regardless, the, for this part, we're going to give everybody a kind of idea. Okay, I love these names. Congenial Broccoli. It's uh, the name of my code space. All right, folks, pay attention to what Mark's doing now. If you're going to give people 10 seconds to switch back to the Zoom so they can learn what's, how the first one will go around. Right, pay attention to what Mark is going to show you. Yeah, so first, uh, going to have to change all these keys. All right, so the step that Mark is going through right now is setting the API keys. You know, one of on Twitter. I don't think he's doing anything. Oh, good. There we go. Perfect. Good. Now I don't have to. Well, ah. OK. <laughs> uh, so there's a readme. The readme is very thin. Uh, oops. Yeah, so here's. So. There's a, a new project uh, called Spring CLI. I'll be giving a talk about it tomorrow in a code theater. Uh, you can think of it as initializer with code, but also not just creating new projects, but being able to add code to your existing project. So that's kind of the really big part of it. And so the way that this flows, this exercise, is we create the project from scratch for exercise one using a command called uh, Spring Boot uh, New. And then each subsequent exercise we'll do by saying Spring Boot Add. So for the first one, you have to have these keys in your environment, and we'll sort that out. And there's an idea of uh, catalogs. And uh, you have to do this command. Uh, I'll paste. Okay. So we do spring project, oops, list. What, the names of them? Yeah, it's in the readme. Uh, hopefully, I don't know how we're going to sort. I mean, For the So, use number 34. Yeah, and I, Mark, I sent you the, uh, on Slack, I sent you the endpoint and I sent you the key. Oh, there's a big issue. Oh, you should want me to post that on the? Yeah, I'll just post it and I'll show it. On the, sure. okay. All right, let me just finish my thought here and then I'll show that. Is that now you have available to you all of these uh, projects that we can either create from scratch or add to an existing project. So the first one that we'll do is uh, Hello World. The formatting is bad because there's a bad low resolution, I guess. But uh, oops. But I'll try to highlight there's others for what we'll do. Thank God. There's a, uh, here's one down here for, uh, Output parser. Actually, it's easier to show it this way because the IDE is uh, condensing it uh, to a small window. So here are all the projects. We're going to start at Hello World. Then we're going to go to prompt templating, then prompt roles, 
then the output parser, and so on. So in the readme, first you add this catalog, right? And then you can create the new project. So I'm going to uh, paste this command. Spring Boot new. My AI is the name of your project. The next one, AI is your hello world, is the name of the code we'd like to base our new project off on. And we're going to refactor it so that it doesn't have the uh, package name in the original repo. You can give it your own package name. Yeah, the, the, the hope is that this is a lot easier than cloning uh, five or six sample repos. So we'll create this one project, and then when we're done with Hello World and we move on to prompts, we're going to add the code from that uh, repo around prompt templating. This could be added to your, the same project. So everything is going to keep building up incrementally into this same project. So we could do this with any repo? Correct. That's like a whole separate talk that I'll have tomorrow in the code theater on Spring AI. Uh, so this tool is generally useful. Like you in your company could do the same thing that we're doing now, except the topic would be different, right? A whole bunch of samples or starters, if you want to call it project starters, but they're not, starters is a bad word though, because boot uses the word starter. So, you know, you can come up with um, your own archetype. Great word. Thank you. Uh, maybe give that man a prize. Uh, uh, yeah, so the idea, generally speaking, is not to go too much down the rabbit hole, is that uh, yeah, like I was working with uh, CVS, right? And CVS uh, makes back-end pharmacy services. They're like thousands and thousands of them. Like People work every week to make a new feature in the back-end pharmacy service. So they have kind of like a template, project template, or you know, Mary has a great version of it. We should copy Mary's, right? And so that becomes the foundation by which you can create a new one. But more importantly, you can add. So the, the goal here is like you can go home, download the Spring CLI tool, go to some project that you currently have in your company, and say Spring Boot Add AI. And it's going to match your package name, right? It's going to do an intelligent merge. It's going to add all the um, Maven properties, all the dependencies that are required. Uh, so there it is, right? This is the new project. And we'll show the code finally. There's supposed to be a code focused workshop. In the example, what is my idea? Yes, so the, the arguments to the Spring Boot new command, right? Think of it as create React app, if people have done that. It's the same idea. The first argument is the name of your project. So if you look at the POM, I called it my AI. And so if you look at the artifact ID here, it's my AI, right? So that is you know, your project name, basically, or the directory name as well. You could change the directory name afterwards, but whatever. The second argument is basically where you'd like to get the code from to put into your new project or add to an existing project. So the way you get the list of what's available is by doing spring project list. I appreciate your patience. It's the first time we're doing, uh, doing two new things at once. So it's, it could be overwhelming, I realize. But I hope it'll be simpler in the end than the alternative. So there's a, there's a lot of things here, right? You can say spring boot new with no arguments. You'll get a web app, right? You can get a JPA app. Scheduling, Eureka, GraphQL, Modulith, right? That needs to be updated. Stream. And so I've created a project catalog for all the code samples we're going to do today uh, in the exercises. Okay? Does that answer your question? Yes, it's like an archetype for Hello World. Yeah, this list exists, exists on uh, GitHub, and uh, you can add catalogs, remove catalogs. So what we did here was we, first step was adding this catalog with all the samples. Because the Spring CI tool, when it comes out of the box, basically has 
the equivalent of the spring getting started guides, right? I can't put, but people want to have their own stuff, right? And we want to have our own stuff for the workshop. So there's the idea of a catalog which groups together relevant domain or relevant archetypes. So that was the first step, adding this catalog. And then, oops. That was the first step. And then we did this, right? Oh, I'm not a VS Code person, so. And then you can give the package name. So if you see D in here, we have this. And finally, after much ado, we have the, the one-liner, right? Uh, yes. Maybe Adib can uh, take a look. He's having some issue. Well, let me run it. Yeah. So, uh, folks, just just for you're gonna have time to do this. So what I'd like everybody to do is to just just make sure you understand the code that's there that Mark is putting on the screen, and then go ahead and do it. We'll give you time to do it. All right. All right. Oops, I made a typo. Code space is taking a while to launch because it's an underpowered VM. To keep you within the 53 hours, we only gave it two vCPUs. And then it needs to launch, it needs to do this thing. It's it normally code spaces are pretty snappy if you turn on a couple of settings and you are actually paying for the service instead of using the free. <laughs> yeah. So the README in this project contains the um God, it's, I can barely keep track of all these. Yeah, okay, where is the preview? Yeah, so there are the keys. We just did the Spring Boot run part, and now there is a utility, <sighs> utility called uh, HTTP Pi. It's an alternative to curl. It's most useful when um, there's um, met, uh, request parameters. It's easier to use. So we'll paste this, uh, and it's going to call that endpoint. And there's a, the request was, in case you didn't see it in the controller, the default request parameter was, uh, tell me a joke, right? So that's the message we're sending. Right? We're saying, AI client, generate, tell me a joke. Right? And so the response is, why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. Ha, ha, ha. And so if we go back to this readme, now you can see it's consistent. Now, uh, oh, I, I don't know why it keeps moving my screen around. Oh, this one I forgot. To, this looks uh, wrong here. Well, maybe not. Anyway. I didn't convert this to uh, use HTTP. So now we'll pass it some data. And why did the cow go to the outer space? To see the moon, right? So you get the idea, I hope, right? There's a controller, takes a message. That message has a default value for the request parameter. Uh, but you can change it uh, and give it something else. So hopefully we'll get this one-liner working. And now you wanted me to show something on the screen. Um, so I put in the Zoom chat the API key to use and the endpoint. So you should be able to pick it up from there. So given the slow internet, 
and be interested Participate. in getting, here's what I'd like everybody to do. I want everybody to focus on getting this Hello World program to work. All right? Once you get this Hello World program to work, the rest of the exercises that are in the repo, you can do it all on your own. Then what we'll focus is on just demoing them from stage. Does that make sense for people? But at least you'll have a working Hello World, you know how to do it, right? Okay, this is a, uh, but that's not the right. Um, no, that's fine. I put it in the chat. Don't worry. Where? No, but does everyone have? Uh, okay, well you can. Yeah, no, that is the right one. No, go back. What chat? It's go back to the Zoom. And go to chat for the Zoom. I don't see uh, anything here. Yeah, man, the chat has been so slow because of the internet. It's taking a while. Is it the keys that he just sent me? Yes. Yeah, maybe. I'm going to have to destroy these keys. I mean, uh, no one's going to copy this. <laughs> Keith, uh, I don't know what to do. I'm not putting it on the internet. No, we need to, yeah, but it needs to be formatted differently. It in that spreadsheet, there's a bunch of data. Here, this is the invariant variable. variable. Grab one of them. I don't care which one you grab. Use that. It will work. Okay. Let's not try to get everything to the same API. Just Yeah, it's the, uh, I can't even present. Oh, it's just screen me? No, it's frozen. I mean, the internet here is beyond bad. Okay. Yeah. I can't even refresh the page. Do you want me to put this on the screen, this key? I mean, they're not going to type it. No, I told you that. And they know how to put it in that special variable name? They're not going to know. Um, Yeah. What space, right? I, I, I heard him say we can use our, the code space for the project, right? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, it looks like I went to your. Yeah, so, that's so, your looking a good spot. Yeah, okay. so but I tried creating the project, but it looks like this project is already there existing. No, that's the directory. Okay. So let's see. Yeah, so all the way to the. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so let's go up. See what happens here. Yeah. 
Oh, you, you didn't add the, um, you have to go to this, this catalog. Okay, 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 sorry, so let's, let, yeah, don't worry. I'm not good with the okay, touchpad, okay, so if you could uh, cut and paste that line. Uh, I know, it's uh, really hurting the workshop. Okay, you just missed the first F though. Okay. okay, that should work, yep. Okay. Perfect. Now just up arrow to the previous command you did. Yeah, just up arrow to get yeah, back to yeah. that one. Oh, I think this is it. Well, send it to me so sure it's the right one. Oh, it's already in the chat from them. Yeah, so it's in the chat now. Oh, you. Okay, yeah. Yes? It's a, I, I think there's a, my local. Um, yeah, but uh, you need the... Uh, if, if I, yeah. I, I have this long space as well. Yeah, let's do it here. It's okay. much better. Here. Okay. So now I did the first step. Now I need no, to yeah, create I a new, new project. Yeah, right, so cut and paste this. Okay, and then C, after this is done, CD to my AI. Okay, then do Spring Boot run. Oh, you had the keys up? Yeah. That. In this window? Probably not. No, no. So.
Context and it's not circumstances. Uh, the turn and bumps out of the oh, okay. uh, attack attack. Uh, sorry. Uh,
apologize. It's not my fault. Like these environments, I think we didn't deploy the model with the correct name or something like that. It's been very stressful trying to get all this work. So here's what we want to do. We want to make sure you get the content. So Mark is going to go through the slides, and instead of you doing the hands-on exercises, he's going to show you what's involved in them. Then post VMware Explorer, we're going to update the instructions, and uh, you'll be able to follow the steps there. And, and I'll show you a little bit of what you have to do on the back end after he's done with the exercises to make this work without dropping. Does that make sense, people? I'm really, really sorry about this. We tried our hardest, but we, you know, all this stuff is new, and you know, we'd rather you try some things than not have fun doing this. So, fine, thank you. Well, oh, we only have a half hour left. It started working, so it takes about five minutes to deploy the model, and so I succeeded in deploying the right model. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we have to one. Okay. It's working, right? So raise your hand if you saw our joke. So a really good question. So the question, if I understand it correctly, is, well, if I call a chat GPT API, I could just use REST template. Is that really your question? Yeah. So here's why. It's a really good question. I'll give you 500 bonus points for that question. So the answer is that when you're trying to do something realistic, let's say in the Acme fitness application, you want to ask the question, what's the fastest store in the, uh, what's the fastest e-bike in the store? And when you, when you ask that type of question, the chat GPT model doesn't know anything about the bikes you're selling in your store because that wasn't part of its training data set, number one. And so you have to create a prompt. And the prompt that you need to create would look something like, here is a list of bike specs. Can you tell me which bike in this list of bike specs is the fastest? 
Does that part make sense? Yeah, you're giving the model context on what you want. Because you're giving the model context on what you want, you have to go through and create the correct prompt. And that is where the value of Spring AI comes. Yeah, I think it's it, not about that, you, yes, you can do it with REST template, but it's all the work you do before you send the request with REST template to form the prompt. It's all the work that you do uh, once the response comes back to park it. So let's say, for example, uh, anybody here work for a bank? Right. Let's say your boss walks in and says, I want you to make a, an LLM interface which says, I can log in and say, how much money did I spend on eating out last month? How would you actually implement that kind of thing with a large time as well? Well, you'd have to do it in multiple steps. The first step is to figure out what the question is that the user is asking, which would require a call to the LLM. You probably have to do something like, hello, chat APT. I know the following details about a customer. I know the transaction date. I know the amount of the transaction. I know the category of the transaction. Here's a question. Tell me which one of those categories the user is asking about. And it'll come back and it might say, like, right, asking about this and that. Then you use that information to create a SQL query or a method sent to your mainframe to then pull that information and process it. Once you have that information, then you go back to the LLM and you can say, hey, can you tell this user that, you know, that this is the amount they spent and it generates the response? Does that make sense to folks? So you're, you're, you're kind of having this conversation with the large language model through multiple interactions. And that's why you want a project like Spring AI as opposed to just I can write template my way to the chat GPT API. So that's one part. Yeah, question? Can you make like debug logs to see the actual Yeah, yeah, there's basic logging, but uh, uh, in what will be coming, right, is not just this basic logging, but there's sort of an ecosystem around the evaluation. And there's even sort of standardized formats of how to save that information and services that say, here's what happened. Figure out uh, if the answer that came back seems related to the question that went in. So there's uh, the logging, and then there's like a step of log analysis, essentially, in the context of AI. Uh, so yeah, there's sort of an industry, burgeoning industry, I'd say a few startups in the space that are trying to offer services uh, in this uh, area. The API give any What? Uh, no, no, so what you have to do is I have a simple evaluator, right, a test class where I give it these two things. That's kind of the last thing. I don't know if we'll get to it. So you can feed it back and say, did it match or give me a score? So you literally write, give me a score between zero and 100, right? Or just yes, no. Uh, so it's really a little bit more, um, I say it's still early days, right? There's some more sophisticated ways than just asking it itself. So uh, the open source project that I found that's best in sort of addressing this that I've been paying attention to, and also some YouTube videos, is uh, Llama Index. If you look for uh, Llama Index in YouTube, uh, one of their more recent talks is evaluating LLM responses. And I think they also partnered with a company that sort of specializes uh, in, in this as well. So that would be resources you can go to dig further in that area. what you do. Yes. Vector search is what you do. But let's, let us get there so everybody else in the group can follow the conversation. I promise you will get there with the, with the demo from the, 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 the fitness folks. Okay? The code watch folks. Uh, you ready to keep going, Mark? Uh, almost. Okay. All right. Um, any other kind of questions about, about this? Yeah.
Can you speak louder? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, you have a lot of data. It's all unstructured. How do you get this into the prompt, right? Let me, uh, so the way you get it uh, into the prompt, there's several uh, techniques. Uh, let me just bring up my uh, slides somewhere. Oops. Yeah, so the way you get it in is you have a concept called the data loader, right? So we provide data loaders for you for all different types of formats. So let's do an example. Suppose you have a lot of uh, README, right? So we'll be getting into some more detail. I'll just try and give the TLDR, right? Uh, you have 15 files of readmes. You have a 16K token size window, but your readmes are uh, 100 K tokens, right? So you can't just shove it all in, right? And we'll have an exercise you'll see called stuffing the prompt. So what happens is we'll take that uh, with a data loader for readmes, and we'll split it up. And we'll intelligently split it up so that it's, let's say, each section is 1 25th of the uh, full token size window, right? Uh, now, when you split it, you can't split like a table right in the middle. So you, you kind of have to know a little bit the structure of your unstructured data, right? It's like when they say, MongoDB, store all your unstructured data here. Now let's talk about MongoDB schemas, right? It's like, yeah, it's unstructured, but you got to put some structure on it. Otherwise, it's just spaghetti, right? So we have data loaders, text splitters, right? And these know about the formats they're inputting and try to intelligently split. Suppose you want to do the same thing against your code. You want to query against your code base. You shouldn't cut in the middle of a function method, right? So you have to kind of know what you're parsing, put some structure in it, and critically chop it up into small pieces so that you can retrieve the relevant parts. And that gets to that gentleman's question about the vector store, is that all those chunks go into a vector store, and you first ask the vector store what's relevant for my query, you take those five documents and you stuff those into the prompt, right? So, you know, this is what we're providing, right? And so what we'll provide at the end of the day is literally a one-liner that says, here's my docs, load it up. Okay, two-liner. Then the next one, query over these docs and it would be the same one-liner that you see before, right? But there's a whole series of operations that's common for this use case, and we provide that, right? So I would add one other thing to the comment, why not just start with REST template, right? It's like, why not start with REST template to interact with Amazon S3? Like, get out of your mind, right? You need a client library. So this is like very typical of what Spring does, and because this is such a nascent industry, every client library is different, but the same. So suppose you're using uh, uh, Azure OpenAI, right? Uh, Azure will probably kill me if he's around. He's not around. That's good. So there's a lot of latency to go over the internet and come back. And maybe you want an AI model that's not as powerful as ChatGPT. There are a lot of models you can run on-premise, provision yourself. And now you want to switch to saying, I'm not going to use ChatGPT. I'm going to use my local model. That's smaller, but still effective for this use case. You're going to rewrite everything to talk to this local model? That's the work we're doing with this abstraction. So you simply say, oh, does Spring AI support you know, uh, Llama 2, which is uh, I'm trying to get my hands on, right? Uh, you can deploy Llama 2 from Meta in your own uh, uh, data center, and then just change one config in Spring, dependency, and you're done. Right, so that's the value. All righty, let's uh, move on. So yeah, uh, I have lots of problems. <laughs> oh yeah, load Maven project. It's not even loading a fucking project. 
you want me to just do the rock code lock? No, no, no. I'll figure this out. I feel like the internet is like uh, throwing my computer for a... It's like, look, here's the whole fucking thing. And I open it up here. I don't know what's... Because it needs to download the dependencies, right? Like, yeah, you have the speakers now? Yes. Sorry. I don't know. It's, it's uh, because it's a snapshot. It has to go maybe just to, go to check for the latest versions. And it's just being very slow. You're scanning, resolving. Yeah, yeah, that's what's happening. All right. Now this is better. All right. There, all this stuff is here. Hooray. All right. Let me just make sure this runs. How do I do that? Okay. All right. So I do apologize for the uh, issue. So that's kind of where we left off. And we'll be going through that. So I'll go back to the slides. Whew. Where were we? The tokens. Yeah. All right, we'll go on to prompt templating, and I'll try to go quick. If there's questions, please raise your hand, and then I can know maybe I'm going too fast or something, because we lost a lot of time. Uh, so much like I was saying in, in the beginning, uh, prompt isn't simply what you normally chat with in ChatGPT. They're very structured things. You have to think about it carefully, and you're going to need placeholders. Uh, so we use string template, which is the, literally the name of the template engine from Terence Parr uh, of Antler fame, if people know him. And uh, you can read in these links about general guidelines, you know, about what... Uh, Maybe it'll even come up here. See, best practices for prompt engineering with open AI. You know, put instructions at the beginning and use these uh, limiters, kind of like markdown limiters, to separate the instructions and the context, right? These, all these little tidbits here are things that you need to follow. And what happens, you know, um, this is a good course as well, uh, in conjunction with the people from open AI. Prompt engineering for developers. So these are the key components. Clear guidance. Give it context. Um, hints at how you want it to respond in what format. Uh, and of course, the actual question uh, from the user, which you might end up massaging, too. Uh, you might take that question and say, hey, chat GPT, rewrite this to be more clear. Right? Something like that. So here's a very simple one. Uh, translate the text that's delimited by triple backticks, right? So you're literally saying, uh, into a style that is X, right? So it's very simple. Uh, and this is the service. And then you can see the text has a single curly brace. Uh, here's another one. You're required to answer the question in the form of five bullet points based on the provided context. Shouldn't answer, shouldn't be larger than 500 words. So you can see how it's starting to grow and grow and grow, right? And you don't want to have a, a raw string in your code, right? This needs to be separated out into a classical MVC-like uh, framework thing. So this was the next one, and I'll demo it, right? It's not just tell me a joke. It's like, tell me a funny joke about you know, a cow. Or tell me, you know, that would be repeating the same one, but now the user has an option to substitute these words. So I'll just go back here to um, uh, make a terminal window. And let me open up the workshop so I can uh, get the command. Oops. Wrong one. That's going to take some time, I guess. 
Let me close that, sorry, for my sloppiness. Okay. Yep. So here's where the magic of spring CLI is. Right. So we're going to go back to my project. I'm going to paste this in. Now we're going to get that code from that sample project shoved into here. So that's the repo where the code is. It's in a different uh, package name, so it refactors it to the package name of our current project. And there's the prompt template controller, right? So you see we're getting from a resource here, prompts, we're getting the joke prompt. We have the AI client, which comes from the Spring Boot starter for, for this. And we have two request parameters, which are just basically being stuffed. So the prompt template takes this resource, and then we ask it to create the final prompt, and the prompt is what we send over. So we're kind of going the next level up in terms of just raw strings. We're giving it some more structure. And this is probably after Hello World, more typical of the API usage uh, you'll see. So if we uh, run this application now, And if you notice, what happens is that the other readme gets put here uh, under the dash AI Azure prompt templating, the name of the repository. So we run it, and now if we do this, oh, that's a weird one. I think I should have rewritten that. Okay, I'll do a terminal window. I was just learning how HTTP works, so paste this. All right, so that's what we've seen before. And now, uh, we could, I guess we could replace this with whatever we want. Oops. Uh, no, it's just uh, however much text you uh, send, it gets converted to tokens. So it's really just a question of the length. Does that answer the question? Is it cheaper? Uh, let's see. I mean, this is the size. This is uh, depends on the size of the adjective and depends on the size of the topic. Right. I don't know where the. Um, so I don't know. Let's take. Let's ask the audience for an adjective. It's like Mad Libs. People remember that. So let's see, an adjective. Scary. Scary. Oh, that's good. About, I need a noun. Unicorn. <laughs> Why did the unicorn refuse to play with the cows? Because they heard they were utterly terrifying. <laughs> OK. Yeah, that's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> Not bad, I suppose. So that's that. Prompt templating. Uh, so you're really going to have to dive down into all the different prompt techniques that there are. Luckily, you know there are resources, kind of like prompt hubs, let's call it, where you can kind of browse and say, you know, I'm have this kind of use case. What prompt should I use? You cut and paste it. You try it out. You're like, oh, it kind of worked. Got me in the ballpark. So we're not going to spend time here. Um, there's even a framework from Microsoft that gets even super fancy about all of this. So you can go back to this and, and look. Uh, what's interesting you know, are some of these more sophisticated techniques. Uh, I'll just show this one. I don't know if it's possible. It shows easily. Nah, it's too complicated to go over now. It's almost like talking to a person. Yeah. So. 
so far we've just been sending simple strings. Uh, and this has evolved into something that you send, a message that has structure. And the structure is based on the AI model providing a concept called roles. So there are three roles right now, and I expect the number of roles probably will grow a little bit, or there'll be sub-roles. Actually, there's a fourth role called function, which maybe we'll get to. Uh, the system role sets the context. Like, you are an AI assistant helping answer information about bicycles from a catalog. Uh, always respond with the name of the bicycle, if appropriate. Right? It kind of sets the tone of how you want the AI agent to respond. Uh, the user role represents your input, and whatever comes back is the assistant role. So if you send information back, again, that it generated, it knows right, that the AI generated this text. Right? So those are the main roles. So those are, you know, this is a, a slide from Microsoft. I'll just read a little bit. You see the system message a brief description of the assistant, the personality. Uh, in a lot of these demos, uh, oh, I didn't ask it for style. I think I jumped ahead to prompt template. Sorry. You can also ask it for a style. A lot of these things ask it to talk in like a style of a pirate. It's kind of funny. Add a little humor into your thing. Uh, user assistant example prompt. So here's how you do that. You create these uh, templates, system prompt template. You are a helpful assistant. Uh, and then you ask it to explain asynchronous programming in the style of uh, Blackbeard. You put these two pieces together into a chat template, because chat, is GPT, is really what initiated this idea of roles. So there's kind of a split brain, if you will. There's like the ways you spoke to AI models before chat GPT, no roles, although they started to hard code roles into the string. And literally, the manuals would say, put user colon. And that would be the user prompt. Put system colon. So it's kind of like they were clearly going in that direction, but now it's formally separated. So you have these two uh, parts of the uh, request. You bring them together, and then you ask it to, to generate. So I'll show that uh, briefly here. Back to the workshop. All right, so I'll copy this. I will paste it here. And we'll get the code for that. I'll stop this. Actually, it's a lot easier just to have a second terminal. All right, so there it is. I have a new role controller. I have the uh, I don't think I use the system resource here. Oh, I do. What is it? Again. Oh, your name is name. Oh, yeah, this is the one with the voice. All right. So let's take a look at this. So there are defaults here, right? Tell me about three famous pirates. Well, let, me f let me show the template first. You're in a, this is the system template. You're an A assistant. Your name is so-and-so. Please respond to the user's request also in the style of this voice, right? So this is the question. This is the name of the AI assistant. This is the voice in which it's going to respond. So. The user uh, goes, message goes into the user message. We create a system prompt template, and we replace name and voice with what is passed in. We create a prompt out of those two, and now we ask it to um, generate the responses. You can actually get, in certain cases, you can ask it to generate more than one, so you can kind of get variations, but normally you just get one response. Oops, sorry. So now let's uh, I'll do this. So I'm just running it. All right, so here's the uh, 
preview. Boy, my computer itself is so slow. So you see, uh, R matey, it'd be me, Bob, the AI assistant, right? And here's all information about uh, these three pirates. So, so any Rick and Morty fans? Uh, only one? That's so sad. Then I guess a lot of people won't get this one. I think I'm going to have to reboot. I can't even cut and paste. So this is, uh, tell me about three famous physicists. Your name is Rick, and in the voice of Rick Sanchez, cartoon character, crazy guy. Yeah. Hi, it's me, Rick. Let me tell you about the three physicists. You know, buckle up, Morty, because we're going on an adventure. That's like the catchphrase of this uh, uh, animation series. Yeah, so that's it. That's the prerequisite. You can go back to this. So output parsing. So as I alluded to earlier, you get back a string. You see, it's just a string. Uh, that's not really great for making applications. So uh, this has been a real pain point uh, that developers have given feedback to uh, OpenAI. Uh, you can get it to work without this new feature, but they introduced a new feature called functions, which sounds like, ooh, I'm invoking stuff, right? Totally misnamed. It should be called formatting. It is literally instructions on the JSON schema of what you'd like to have come back, and this is essentially another role. It just came out like a month ago. Uh, I don't have support for it yet, but the general gist of it is uh, show you in this uh, uh, next uh, demo here. So it's usually a lot more complicated than this, but here's an example of what you can do for very simple queries. Like make a list of three uh, made up book titles along with the authors and genres. Provide them in JSON format with the following keys. And it'll do that. Uh, but once you start getting more complex, you have to really start to give it a lot more hints. And so, uh, yeah, see another one. Please ensure the format's accurate and can be directly parsed as JSON. So it's kind of like you're begging it, right? It's like, please give me JSON. Please, please, please. Uh, and so that's why they came up with that new um, uh, feature. But I'll show you how this works. Uh, yeah, so this is the overall flow in case it hasn't you know, snapped yet. So you have this string template, usually a resource file has placeholders, so you ingest that string template in a prompt template, and this is, uh, then you send a message, you form this chat message so you can give it better context with the system role, you send it to AI client, and then the response goes to an output parser that will convert that string to a data structure you can use in your application. So we'll do that demo now. Uh, okay. I just want to check out what's going on my machine real quick because the fan is going bananas. Xorg, 90, it must be the Zoom. Eesh. Poor machine. Okay, so let's go to the output parser one. And I will uh, stop the previous running app. I'm going to paste this.
Okay? So now we're going to get a readme, which is output parsers. So this, the, what we, the code we just added has an endpoint under AI slash output. The only input request is a uh, actor, and it has a default value of Jeff Bridges. So Spring AI provides something called the bean output processor, because really what you want is to get back objects mostly, right? You might like JSON, but if you combine it to an object, so much the better. And so I'll show you the code very briefly for this. Here's output. So we have this class. It has an actor and it has a list of movies. We look at the controller. Here I uh, did this this morning, so I didn't put it in a resource. Bad habit. Yep. Yes. Yeah, all of this is available. Yep. Hmm? I don't see it anymore. Where? Where are you looking? In the It's not there. All these samples, uh, if I go maybe here, oops. So the alias of that word, you know, um, AI, blah, 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 dash output, you see here, output parser. It's living in this rd-1-2022. Yeah, so this is where they really live. And the name is just an alias. So when you have a catalog, so you can use Spring CLI and say, give me the code from this repo, and you type in the repo name. That works too. But it's much more easy to deal with friendly names. Uh, and so that's the feature of Spring CLI catalog is to have a name associated with the repository. So walking through this, um, we create this bean output parser for the actor films. Uh, we get the format, right? And let's take a look at that. Uh, we'll take a look at mm, how was the best way to look at that. Actually, let's just print it out here. Okay, get the filmography for the actor, and here's the format, right? We create a prompt template, giving it uh, that string. We fill in the actor with actor, the format. With the format we retrieve from the output parser, we create a prompt, we talk to the client, we get the first response, and then this is the, uh, the big part. We take the response's text, which is just a string, and it gets marshaled into or deserialized into uh, this class, and we return that. So I will run this. All right. Paste. All right, so there's the answer. All right, he's done a lot of movies. Hopefully some are your favorites up here, right? And so if you look now at, oh, I guess we'll have to look in the other tab. At what that format was, this is something you'd never want to type yourself, right? So your response should be in JSON format. Do not include any explanations. Only provide RC yada yada compliant. Here's the JSON schema, right? And so what the Spring AI library is doing is taking your beans under the cover, generating the JSON schema in the very weird draft version that OpenAI supports. So you can't use Jackson's schema generator. I have to find another one that supports their weird variant of the never-ending litany of draft specifications for JSON schema. Uh, so yeah, this provides it the structure, right? 
the, this uh, JSON schema? The JSON schema? No, this is generated by the Spring AI library inside the... Um, sure, I'll go right to it here. All of that is inside this bean output parser. Let's see if I can bring that. So here it is. This is bean output parser. You give it a class. It generates the schema using this friendly library. And then uh, you ask it for the format. Again, I'm using raw strings here, but you get the idea. That's what we saw before. JSON schema, right? So this is the helper class you need in order to parse the output. If you weren't getting this mapping, so there are others. You see here I have a, a list output parser for CSVs. There's a map output parser, so you can get sort of arbitrary key value pairs that you might not know and then search for them. And, you know, there's kind of a long list, but probably people will focus on the bean one, uh, assuming, again, assuming that uh, you really get the model to reply. Otherwise, you get an error, right? And it's very brittle. Uh, and so this is probably the best you can do without using the functionality that uh, only GPT has that they introduced last month called functions, which, again, not at all what you think. It should be called formatting. Other questions? You're starting to use more tokens, yeah. Uh, if you gave it the JSON? No, that was the response. Right? So let's go through this again. Make sure we all understand on the same page. Yeah. So our user message, right? Let's do this. We're asking it for the filmography of the actor, right? And now we have to coerce it to provide the right reply. So the right reply, if you just say, uh, please give me Jason, I had this, I was just doing this morning, uh, it'll put extra characters around it, right? It'll just say, here's your reply, I'm being very helpful, let me give you some more garbage words, right? So you have to give it a prompt, uh, sorry, where was it? Oh, sorry. Uh, in the bean output parser, it's kind of hidden in here. It's like, this is where you start to get a little uh, nasty, right? You're not very polite to me. You're saying, respond in JSON. Don't do anything else. Better be compliant to this. And furthermore, it better adhere to this, right? It's like you're scolding a child. If you don't scold it, it wants to talk. And you can't parse that into JSON. So this is what finally gets sent over the wire with everything replaced. If you want JSON back, you should use this uh, hash map output parser and then pass that to Jackson and get a JSON string. But uh, those are probably the most two common cases, right? But a lot of people like, you know, why are we using Jackson as a library? We want to map it to our beans, right? So those are the two options. And there's a list one. And there's, there's others that we can implement over time uh, that do different things. Okay, so let's uh, move on. Uh, uh, talk about chains. I don't have a demo for chains, but uh, I'll explain the concept briefly. Um, it's a series of calls. So I'll give a, a, a simple example. Uh, this is one from the manual. It's like the first step in the chain is uh, 
come up with a funny name for a company uh, that sells X, right? That's the, role, that's the first interaction. Uh, then you take a separate thing, a separate uh, prompt. So now you have the output company name, right? And then the next prompt is come up with a business plan for company name, right? And so you chain these two things together. So you could have done it in one step, but a lot of times that one step will kind of be complicated or the next step, even more sophisticated, is like, well, uh, the next step is, if the name of the company seems like it's in the sector of industry, uh, call this function, call this other message. If it's in the sector of, you know, entertainment, you know, call this. So you start to build up smarts, right? And it starts to make decisions about where it goes next. So the simplest case is, here's a straight line through um, series of request, response, you take the response, pass it to the next request, and you keep going. So this is, uh, comes up very, uh, very frequently. So here, here's one example. Uh, given this news article, you know, extract the following information. So extraction is its own sophisticated you know, uh, use case, right? Uh, summarization, its own sophisticated use case. The sentiment analysis, own sophisticated use case. You're, and these are you know, building blocks, and you kind of want to chain them together, right? My example before is super trivial just to get the idea, but this is a much more realistic scenario. So I don't have an example for this. So, we'll, so yeah, this is uh, the good stuff. So what are the limitations of modals? Limitations of uh, AI models. So they only know about what data they've been trained on, right? So if you um, uh, ask it a question beyond what it knows, it'll say, I don't know. Or sometimes it just makes up stuff, which is even worse, which is why you have this temperature knob. Anyway, the, the data set that it's been trained on uh, is, uh, basically two years old now, right? It's getting a little long in the tooth. And if you want to summarize something, for example, a book, a book is not going to fit inside this context window we were talking about. It's too big. So you have to use some software engineering techniques to make this work given the size of the context window you have. So there are two techniques. One they call fine tuning. This is historically how models have been uh, adjusted in the machine learning community. Uh, you change the weights on this model. The weights in my mind map to some kind of network that, you know, sort of like a neural network like model in my mind. I'm sure it's way more sophisticated than that. Uh, there's tons of papers you can read on the structure of these things, but I don't pay too deep attention to it. Uh, but you can't retrain chat GPT. Like I just earlier showed a slide that said, we don't support it. In chat GPT-3 they did, uh, and maybe earlier, but now they don't. And no one in this room probably has the skill set to even remotely attempt doing that. So what do you do? It's hard to do, and sometimes you can't. So someone, I don't know who, they should get a Nobel Prize, came up with this uh, equivalent of SQL injection, which is like, just shove everything in the context. And uh, we'll see an example of that uh, right now. Uh, yeah. So here's the example we'll do. Uh, it doesn't know about the 2022 Winter Olympics. If you go to ChatGPT and sell, say, who won you know, uh, uh, curling, the sport of curling, who were the medalists, and all that kind of stuff, it says, sorry, can't help you, right? But what we can do is um, make an endpoint that uses this prompt template, right? This is the user prompt template. So in it, it has the question kind of pre-canned here for the purposes of uh, demonstration, saying, here's an article I got from Wikipedia. Uh, you know, use it to answer. And if you don't know, don't make anything up. So you get the text from Wikipedia. You shove this into the prompt. And now it's going to answer, right? So we'll do that one next.
Okay, control C that. And we'll add this code for stuffing the prompt. Okay, so here's our um, <clears throat> Oops, I opened the wrong one, I think. That's the one. Okay, stuff the prompt. So uh, let's see. I actually wanted to show you the. Uh, oh, this might blow my machine up. Mm. Let's not do that. Trust me, if you ask it, it doesn't know. I was going to go to ChatGPT and show you it doesn't know. Take my word for it. Um, so let's look at the code briefly. So here, now we have a uh, document converted from Wikimedia format, which is the worst of all possible formats, converted into a readme file, right? So here's the entire thing, right? Pretty big, right? It's all the information about curling. Here's the uh, prompt that I just showed you before. A little different, actually. Using the following pieces, you know, answer. If you don't know, just say so. So here's the context. Here's the question. So by default, there's a which athletes won the gold medal. And Oh, yeah, that's right. I have the stuff it true or false. That's how we do this. I forgot. It's been a while. So uh, depending on that value, either we put the, content, put the document that read me in the prompt, or we don't. And then we ask it to, uh, to generate. If you don't put it, it doesn't know about it. So this is an example of how you bring your own data to be answered by AI model. Sorry? I mean, if it makes stuff it false, then it no, uh, not the Yeah, well, okay. it can make stuff up, too. Like, if I can go to ChatGPT and say, who won the 22 Olympics? Uh, I think because this is the most common example, it'll never not answer. But Because <laughs> uh, now it's part of like the institution of uh, AI uh, Learning, right? I'm not like inventing some of these things out of the blue. Like, this is comes from other training material or samples that OpenAI itself uses. This, uh, open, this is an example ported from the OpenAI cookbook. Um, so uh, let's see it in action. Let's open up the README. Oh, not that one. This one. Yeah. So. We'll see what this says. All right, so let's run. OK. Paste this in. So I'm sorry, it hasn't taken place yet, right? Clearly wrong. So now we say, yep, let's stuff it. Yep, so there it is. Each tournament had a gold medalist. They were Nicholas, da 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 da, and uh, so on. All right, so zooming along. 
So this is where it starts to get to your question uh, you had over, uh, earlier. Um, this is a contrived example. Like I made a purpose-built endpoint to answer questions on curling. But, you know, it's kind of probably not the most common use case, right? Uh, so you don't know ahead of time, you know, what, what document to include. And the documents need to be shorter than the token size, right? So if you wanted to uh, have it answer questions about every event in the Olympics, you'd have to download every Wikipedia article about every uh, event. Uh, and it's going to be larger than the context size window. So what you do is you store all these documents in something called a vector store, vector database. Uh, and now you actually query the vector database first, before you ever go to the AI model. And you say, based on this input about, let's say, you know, who won ping pong or uh, uh, ski jump, right? Who won the ski jump in uh, 2022 Winter Olympics? It's going to find the pieces of documents that are relevant for your query. And then it will stuff the prompt with those things, right? So the first part, oops. I don't know why. There must be some weird animation. Yeah. Sorry, it's so slow here, I can't even quickly navigate. Yeah. So this is the technique called retrieval augmented generation. So on the left-hand side, uh, you have all your documents about the Winter Olympics, right? Or whatever it is. We're going to show the bicycles catalog that was used to power the demo uh, in the Spring 1 keynote. And now you chop them up into all small little pieces so that no one document is kind of big, certainly not bigger than your context window, but let's say, you know, a few percent size because you want to get a bunch of them, right? So you chop it all up and you store it. So that's the loading part. If your documents on the left-hand side change, you kind of have to have a process to reload this database with the new information. So now, here's where the querying happens, right? So who won the gold medal, right? Or we can ask it a different question in this, uh, who won the, you know, the, the, long, the ski jump? You, you go to the vector database, and this little math formula here is called cosine similarity. All those numbers I showed before of how a, Word gets converted into tokens. Those tokens are essentially like a mathematical space, right? So you can think of two-dimensional space, x and y. And so, um, uh, except this is like much larger. It's like, you know, 20 dimensions or something. But all the formulas are the same, right? So if you want to know, you know, the length of something, you know, the x squared plus y squared, you know, and uh, if it was, then you had Z, or it just keeps going off the number of dimensions. So you query it, it finds similar documents. Uh, maybe I can show this slide. Yeah, what do I mean by similar? Just imagine your XY coordinates. If two things are pointing in the same direction, they're similar, right? And they're separated by a small angle. If they're 90 degrees apart, uh, it's not unsimilar, but they're unrelated, right? Which is an important distinction. And if they're kind of pointing in the opposite directions, uh, they're opposite. So cosine similarity is that formula before. And now we get two of the fragments that are most relevant to the query. We shove it into the prompt, send it to the AI model, and out comes the answer. So this is the, the technique uh, that you can start to use on your own data, right? And this is where the concept of data loaders come in. Do you want to get your data from SQL? Do you want to get it from a code base? Do you want to get it from you know, there's 20, you know, hundreds of sources you can get it from. So these data loaders are pretty smart, right? They have to look at it. They have to put some structure around it. They have to uh, chop it up, right, and then store it in a vector database. Uh, so that, this recipe happens over and over again. So this is something we uh, make easy, or we'll be making even easier than you'll see now. Uh, yep, so I'll show this next, and then you'll go on. Okay, let's stop this. Oh, I 
think it's uh, what is it? Maybe I screwed something up. Hmm. All right, let me just show you the, uh, I must have done something wrong there. I will show. Oh, you think there's a little extra? Oh, OK. Good eye. OK. So here it is. Uh, I'll just start this up in the background. So if we look at the controller, it's going to be a lot longer. And this is something we'll put into a chain eventually. So you won't have to type all this. So we're using the data set from the bike. The default question is, what's a good bike for city commuting? Now you can see we're starting to make go beyond you know, the need for just having everything in a control. We need a service layer. Here's all the bike data. The bike data is this JSON file. Here's our prompt. For Q&A, you're an assistant about a question is about a bicycle catalog using information in documents. And this is kind of a trick, not a trick, yeah, a little hack to say, here's the marker where the documents are. Answer involves referring to price, include the bicycle name. If unsure, say you don't know. And so I don't think we're going to have time to go over everything here. So I'll go through it once, and uh, hopefully you can read it later. So we have to load this JSON. We have to tell it which fields we want. And then we get a bunch of documents. Now we have to take these documents, and we have to do this math that turns the words essentially into these embeddings. And we store it. And this is a simple in-memory one. Now we have to retrieve uh, information from it. So we're going to go to the vector store and say, given this message, give me the list of similar documents, right? get a bunch of them. And now we start to um, create the system message uh, with the similar documents. That provides the context. The user message with the question. We put those two together in the prompt. We send the prompt off, and it replies. So those are the high-level steps. Oops. OK. Off we go. It's going to ask which bike is appropriate for city commuting. And if we go back here, it's going to take a little while. It's splitting it up into chunks so that it's small, and um, there's some debugging here. And it prints out the relevant documents, which you know we don't, won't go through. And then it says, here is the generation. Both the Swift Ride Hybrid and Eon, blah, 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 good for city commuting, and so on, right? So that's how that works. And I'll let Adib uh, take over so you can see more of the Azure aspects. Thanks uh, for your patience. Uh, yeah. Sorry. We can answer questions uh, after yeah. as well. Well, so what I'm going to do now is um, walk, show you how to embed this kind of thing inside of a much more realistic scenario. So we'll cover like a multi architecture, multi <clears throat> application. All right, I'll get this later. Uh, let me just plug in here. <laughs> Let's 
Can you stop sharing, uh, Mark? So I can share the... Okay. I need to mirror my display, just a second. Where's the mirror button? Okay, there we go. Let's go to the Zoom. Uh, Mark, can you stop sharing, please? All right, no, that's all good. All right, there we go. All right. All right, floating meeting controls. Okay. All right, uh, folks, can you see the screen on the Zoom too? All right. So just to give you a sense of what is it that we're looking at, I've got this Acme Fitness application. When you go here, you can shop for bikes, so you can ask it questions like, uh, my town, uh, I live in a hilly area. Uh, what bikes are best for big hills, okay? Legitimate question you could ask in a bike shop. So it's going to go and it's gonna get a response. Now this one isn't gonna show it because it's gonna stop in my IDE um, on, uh, on the debug session because I'm actually running it uh, with a remote debug. And uh, did I, yeah, that's, that's right, okay. So what we want to talk about is how do you go about integrating it into something like this? For reference, the application is running on um, Azure Spring Apps, which is a service for deploying your Spring applications. And it has multiple components. So there's a Spring Boot service called Assist Service, which is used to handle interaction with uh, Azure OpenAI. There's a shopping cart service written in Python, catalog service written in C Sharp, Front end in JavaScript, identity service in, C in boot, order service in uh, C sharp, payment service in boot. Okay? Everybody clear on this? So, what is it that you have to do to get this, to get this working? We don't want to send our data to chat GPT. We want a private deployment in that. So, within the Azure um, portal, what you'll notice is there's an Azure Open AI service. When you click on that, it's going to, you can go and you can say, I want to create a new one, fill out a form, and um, uh, you can, like, let's try this here. So I'm going to pick the demo resource group. I'm going to call this, I want it in East US. I'm going to call it a deep two. And um, click next. Pricing tier, let's pick standard. And it's going to go off and it's going to make it for me. The end result of it making it for me is that. I see it here. So here's my Adeep OpenAI. And this is where you get your keys and endpoints from. That's what you were putting in that export. Who's with me so far? All right, so you go through this. When you go through this process, uh, you might discover that your account is not enabled for it and it tells you to fill out a form. You fill it out and you wait and then they'll approve it. Post doing that, one of the really coolest things you'll see here is you'll see this thing here called model deployments. You click on that and I click on manage, this takes you to a different portal called the Azure AI Studio. And we'll go here and we'll deploy a chat GPT privately for our own usage. So you can see here, I can create a new deployment of a model. And in my drop down, I can see different things. Like I want chat GPT 3.5 turbo, which I think has a like a 4K limit uh, for the context. Uh, or I can select um, 16K1. And then I'm going to give it name Adib's uh, deployment. Okay. Um, oh, I don't have any more coda for this. So let's let's pick uh, this one here. Okay. And hit create. And in about five minutes, this thing will be active, and you can start sending it queries. So everybody clear on how you deploy the 
So this is a little bit, I thought it was super easy because it worked the first time I tried it. <laughs> And I didn't follow or read any documentation. I just clicked my way to happiness by going, ah, click add, okay, try it, next, next, all that stuff. So once once you have this working, let's kind of go to the to the Java code. Uh, we have all this specs about bikes. So if we go here to data, we have these like bike JSONs that describe our um, our system. Now. Interestingly, we use ChatGPT to generate those fake bike descriptions. <laughs> so you can't go buy an e Adrenaline 8.0 EX1 because ChatGPT came up with the bike specs. Now, when you have these fake bike specs, obviously the model doesn't know anything about them. So if you want to ask a question about the bike spec, you need to put the details in the, uh, in the context using the techniques that Mark was showing you. Does that make sense to folks? And, uh, and so uh, part of that is, let's go, for example, here to our, um, to our code. You'll see that there is a Fit Assist controller. OK, it's a Java, it's a, it's a Spring MVC controller. It has a question. And it has an Acme chat request, which in the context of this app, it has the name of the page in the web app that it's on. Because if you're on the Turbo EX1 bike and you ask a question, how fast does it go? You don't want it to answer it about a different bike. Who's with me on this? You want it to basically take the product description for the Turbo EX1, send that to the LLM, and say, given this product, uh, this bike specification, tell me how fast it goes. Tell me how often I need to recharge my battery. Who's, in sense? Okay, good. So we need to know the page that it's on. We need to know the product ID so we can go to the product's database and like form URLs and stuff like that. Uh, this is the list of conversations we've had with the LLM about this particular product. And that's basically just a simple bean. Okay, so in our chat, uh, a fit assist controller, we got this from the JavaScript. And then uh, what we do is we call the chat service dot chat method. So let's go take a look at this. And in this case, we know the ID of the product. So step one is we're going to go retrieve from our database from the, uh, uh, the, the, spec the specification of this product ID. So this is the text that describes the product. Then what we're going to do is we're going to convert this into an embedding, okay? And like, now I wanna ask, answer the question, like what exactly is an embedding? So the embeddings are like, I think of them as the magic sauce that makes this, all of this stuff work. So in the resources folder, there's a file called vector JSON. And, and in here, you'll see, for example, there's a velocity air MIPS road bike helmet, all right? There's some text description about this. And then there's this thing called an embedding, and you can see it's just a lot of numbers. And it's gonna go on for about 1,500 lines. And what do these numbers mean? I have no clue. How do you get those numbers? Well, the way you get those numbers is you make an API call to the large language model, and you pass it this text here, and it comes back with this magic 1,500 numbers. All right, so if I collapse this here, we'll go find something else, like this is the e Adrenaline E8.0 EX1, and there's the embedding that it belongs to. Is this the first time, any, who's, this is the first time you see an embedding, raise your hand, okay? Now, what do you do with these embeddings? You take them and you store them in your database. Okay, you store them in your Postgres database, your MongoDB database. In this case, we kind of wanted to keep it simple, so our database is a JSON file. That's not realistic in a production scenario. So let's go back to the chat service. So now, we take the chat messages and um, uh, we, we take it, we get the embeddings that are supposed to go in there, and then we kind of form a response. Eventually, we get to this search top K nearest, okay? This is magic sauce interesting. So let's, let's go to this. 
And you can see that in this case, this is uh, an interface, okay? And it's called the vector store interface. So for this vector store, we have, we are saying we're going to give you a vector and you're going to find all other vectors in this database, which are the closest to it. Now, does anybody remember line linear algebra from uh, university? So what's happening here is this is something, you know, Spring AI is going to do for you out of the box at some point. Okay? It is going to uh, go and do a search and there's this function here called embedding math, okay? And there's something called cosine similarity, dot product, all this stuff. So essentially, if you go back to linear algebra, you have a vector and you're searching through other vectors and when you do the cosine search, you're searching for the angles of the vectors. If you don't care about math like me or a developer, even though I, I actually hold a bachelor of math degree, all you have to know is this is the equivalent of the where clause. Select from customers where email equals to something. But it's a probabilistic search. So what you're doing is the, the dark magic of, of the vector search or the vector store is going to take the input vector, which was whatever the question that the user typed, and it's going to search for other vectors that match that. And you're basically saying, hey, just give me the top five matches. Then you take the top five matches and you use those to create the context that you give to the large language model. Who's following me? Okay. So whatever product descriptions match these top five, you're basically saying to the large language model, I have a question about this bit of text. <laughs> And so this is where, for example, you get here to the LLM client generate, which is the Spring AI uh, uh, project. And if we look here in the prompts, you can see, for example, let's go through this prompt here and have everybody give a chance to read it. You are an AI assistant of this website named Acme Fitness Store, which sells bikes and accessories online. You help people find information. Please answer the question based on the following product details. Okay? And so between the dashes, you're putting the product details. The name of the product, what tags it's under, accessory, bike, helmet, whatever it is, the short description of the product, the full description of the product, and, um, and all this. And then, then try to improve your answer using the following additional information, any additional information you have. You guys, you guys folks, are you with me so far? So what's happening in the chat service is we need to basically uh, generate a prompt. Uh, we need to create a prompt that has all of this information. We need to merge it based on, the, on, on, on like, you know, what are, what are these things going to get replaced with in curly braces? Who's starting to see the value of building a chain, right? So when people talk about prompt engineering, what they're talking about is how do you create a prompt with the right information that came from your own data, which the LLM doesn't, has never seen ever? And the common technique that people use is this like, what's called the retrieval augmented generation, where you take all of your personal data that you have that in your company, and you give that data to the LLM and then you get a vector embedding for each chunk of data, which you store in a vector database. And then when a question comes in, you turn the question into an embedding. And then you search your vector database to find the, ma the top match matches. You extract the actual text, not the numbers, but the actual text that the embeddings belong to. And you use that to engineer a prompt. And then you send that prompt to the LLM you get a response back and then you might need to post process that response to parse its output. Folks with me? So very interestingly, when you look here, notice that this thing that I'm talking to, I deployed this one here for fun and giggles, right? But you'll notice here that there is a model called text-embedding-ada-00. That is the thing that's making the magic numbers. 
So each LLM that you're going to run into is going to really have like two endpoints. One API call that you give it text, it gives you back magic numbers. And one endpoint where you give it text and a question, it gives you back text and a response. Right? So your task as just a regular developer building and adding AI capabilities to an existing application is to figure out how and where you're going to plug in this AI and, and what are you going to use it for. So let's go back to my scenario of um, I, I'm, let's say, the bank, and it's online banking, and you want to ask the question, how much money did I spend on eating out last month? Okay, where is the list of all the transactions about what money I spent? It's in the bank's mainframe. All right? Has the large language model seen this? Absolutely not. Okay? So, how do you answer that question? You start step one, you go and you create the Azure OpenAI, you deploy a private chat GPT for, or, you know, Turbo, 3, 5, whatever. You have a model and you have an embedding. Then in the chat box, when, when I, after I log into online banking, your application knows who's logged in, knows that Deep is logged in. So when I ask the question, how much money did I spend on eating out last month, okay, what you want to do is send that question to the large language model and say, ask it, here's a question, tell me what date range this represents. And it, it can turn it back and give you a date. This is a question about an interval which finishes, not like last month, it'll be like July 1st or July 31st, uh, uh, 2023. Okay, now you got that piece of information. What do you do with it? You send a message to your existing API that retrieves customer transactions and says, can you please give me a deep transactions for the last up until starting from July 31st to today? You guys with me so far? You get back a JSON or something, okay? Now you take that and then you stuff it, you put it into a prompt and then you say, hey, large language model, you're a helpful assistant, blah, blah, blah. Here's some list of transactions can you tell me which of those are like, I don't know, uh, eating out? Now, if you have that from your actual backend API where it told you the category, you could do that filtering yourself, right? Now, how do you know what category the user asked? You might have to go to the LLM and say, uh, I have three categories of, uh, uh, of, 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 of like transactions, right, or types of businesses. Here's a mapping, here's this, tell me, tell me this question, which category is it asking about? And once you know the category, you filter out that list, and then you add it up. So in the process of answering a question like, how much did I spend on eating out last month? You, you're going to have to interact with the LLM to figure out what the nature of the question is, what data you need to pull, and then how to summarize that for the user. Once you have the summary, like, okay, I deep spent $150 on eating out in the last month, you need to form a human response. You can't just print 150, right? You wanna print something like, yeah, last month you spent $150 eating out at restaurants. And in that case, to generate the human readable response, you go back to the large language model and you say, I'm gonna give you a fact, a deep spent $150. Can you format an output? And it will give you something. Who, who's with me? Starting to grasp the, the architecture of this? So your task as a developer is pretty simple. Just software engineering, that's it. It's, this is data engineering. This is figuring out how to form the right prompt. It's writing tests to make sure that it works. It's like minimizing the number of tokens. It's like, where, where, where do I get, like, in this retail scenario, if you were to make it more realistic, what happens when you add a new product to the product database? What do you need to do? for 500 bonus points. You need to get the magic numbers that are the embedding. If you were to stop selling a product, what do you need to do? You need to make sure that it doesn't show up in the vector search. So you need to remove it from the vector store. So you have quite a lot of data engineering you need to do to actually build an AI solution or add that to your app. So the reason why I got so excited 
about all this AI stuff is it's like having a new service on par with having a SQL database or a message queue or a cache. It enables you to start doing new things you could not do before, but it does have limits, right? And you can, you know, you can, you can, you can build these solutions. They don't have to be perfect. Like, don't start with life and death stuff. Like, I wouldn't want this uh, chat service about my medications and all this type of stuff. But it's like, how much money did you spend eating out last month? It's like, well, it's off by like ten dollars. Like, wow, I, I'm not doing anything. Nothing bad is going to happen, right? If I ask it questions like, how much uh, money can I still contribute to my? Um, RRSP, or when is my next mortgage payment due? Uh, how much do I still have on my mortgage, right? Like, these are all facts where could, you, you, with the LLM, you can figure out what question the user is asking. You could even form a, a, con a confirmation question. Hey, I think you're asking me for blah, blah, blah. Are you sure? Is this, did I, did I understand you right? And you say yes, and then it goes and does the right thing. But how is this any different than you call up the bank, right? And you're talking to a, the bank's agent, and you ask them for something, and they misunderstand your question. Who's had that happen to them? Right? And then you had to clarify. So treat the LLM the way you would treat a human. It may misunderstand you. The quality of the response you get back is equivalent to the quality of the question that you asked. Yeah? Sorry? Yeah. No, you wouldn't embed all the transactions, but you would embed the kind of questions that people would ask. Right? So you know, so for example, like how many different ways are there to ask how much money did I spend on X, right? Whatever X is. So if you have enough of those, you may be able to, to do that. Or you may be able to do embeddings of the different, the schemas right, that you have and the categories. Um, like I don't have a perfect solution for this. I'm actually going to post explore, try to build this sample exactly like for an online banking type to figure out what the data engineering is involved in making it work. Of course, we're use Spring AI for that, right? And the, the really cool thing for everybody that was here today is just want to wrap up, say thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience with the, um, with, with the environment and the AV issues and all of that. Just to give you a sense of how fast this came together, um, it was like, a, let's do this about three weeks ago knowing fully well that all this stuff was new, we'd never done it before, but it was too exciting to pass up on. Uh, now you know where the Spring AI project is. It's a very young project. If you're into open source, do consider contributing to the project. Try it out, use it, open issues, give feedback, all of that. Mark is the, is the tech lead for it. Um, we have a bunch of shirts here for Azure. We have also tickets to the golden uh, party tonight. So Asher, do you want to come out and hand them out or you know, figure out how people will get them? We'll hang out for a bit and answer any questions you have. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. I don't have the slide open. Okay. Yeah, maybe you bring your laptop and you, you show it. Okay. So and while he's doing that, am I got any more questions? Sorry? Oh, where is that? Oh, the Acme. Oh, sorry. I should show you. So that one is 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 available. Uh, it's on GitHub. You can search for Acme Fitness Dash Store Azure Samples. You'll find it there. And we have uh, three different directories in here. There's one directory that has all of the apps in it, like the assist, the cart, all of that, right? There are, there's a directory here called Azure Spring Apps. And in here, you're going to find like step-by-step -step instructions for deploying the sample application. Everything from spinning up the, uh, the, the, the Azure Spring Apps to deploying the, the individual pieces and all of that. And there's also a directory here for deploying it directly on Kubernetes with Tenzo application platform. I need to update that piece, okay? So give it, a, give it like a week or two before checking back on it. Um, you can reach me on, um, on, on at ASICALI on uh, Twitter, GitHub, all this place. Don't hesitate to reach out, ASICALI at VMware.com. Anything related to this, um, you know, um, 
we're happy to, to do that. Expect, look out, be on the lookout for future webinars and things like that on Spring AI. We're gonna refine this content and congratulations for being the first batch to suffer through 0 0.1 alpha snapshot. <laughs>